College can be a tricky time to manage your finances. On top of likely having little to no income, it's also likely that you have little understanding of your own finances. That's no dig at all. We've all been there. The modern education system does little to equip kids, adolescents, and budding adults with the tools to really understand their finances. So naturally, by the time you become a budding adult, you can and probably have started earning an income for yourself. But the other side of that coin is you're expected to start managing your own expenses when it comes to food, when it comes to rent, and everything else. And that can prove tricky, especially if you don't have any guidance. Some people pick it up quickly, but not everyone. And as a result, we see a lot of college kids who are coming out of the gate already saddled with personal debt. And I'm not just talking student debt. That's a whole nother beast, a whole nother set of videos. I'm talking specifically about credit card debt. And since you clicked on this video, it's fair to assume that you may be looking for your first resource to really understand how your credit card works, how credit works, how to pay your card, etc. So we're gonna do just that. Let's start off by looking at some stats. So we wanna first frame this issue of credit card debt so we can understand how widespread it is. And to also see how other college age kids are approaching their finances. So here's a stat. U.S. News found that 46% of college-age kids who have a credit card also have debt on that card, meaning roughly half of college kids who have a credit card carry a balance on it from month to month. Sounds bad, but it's not all doom and gloom. In that same U.S. News survey, they found that in that percentage of kids who have credit card debt, 60% of them have between zero and $1,000. So for a lot of college-age kids who are in debt, maybe you're one of them, it's realistic that you could potentially be out of debt in as little as a few months. And if you have more debt, well, you got more work to do, but it's doable. See, getting into credit card debt is really the product of one of two scenarios. Either you lack financial literacy or you lack financial responsibility or both. Usually it's a mix of both. So with these conditions in mind, let's make sure you have a basic understanding of how credit works and how using your card can impact you negatively or positively. So there's a lot of misinformation and general lack of understanding when it comes to credit cards, credit, and how to use your card. So we can start super basic and then move on from there. When you open a credit card, naturally, you probably know that it comes with a credit limit. That's the maximum you're allowed to have borrowed at a specific time. And let's say you hit the maximum. Let's say your credit limit is 2000, you hit 2000. You're no longer able to charge anything on that card until you pay off some of the balance. You're also probably familiar with the idea of your monthly minimum payment. When you pay this amount each month, it's what keeps your account in good standing. And yeah, that's how you avoid a late fee. But, and this is a big misconception, even if you pay off the monthly minimum, any remaining balance is going to accrue interest. So even though you paid the minimum, that doesn't mean that you're avoiding interest because you still have a balance. So this is where the actual interest rate comes in. Let's keep the example going. Let's say you paid off your minimum balance, but you still have a balance left over. You may know the interest rate of your card off the top of your head. For this example, we could just say it's 25%. That's your annual percentage rate or APR for short. Now, even though it's 25% per year, annually, the interest is actually calculated on a daily basis. So to find the percentage you pay every day on your balance, you divide that APR by 365. So in this case, it's 0.0685%. So let's keep it going further now. We can jump into Excel and piece it all together. So your credit limit was 2000. Let's say you've hit that limit, you spent the 2000. So that's your balance owed. And when your statement comes in, the minimum payment owed is $40. So let's say it's the due date and that you've only paid that $40. You've avoided a late fee, which in itself is good, but the remainder of that balance is gonna still accrue interest. So now we can calculate that accrual. So on the remaining 1960, it's gonna be that 0.0685% per day. And each day you're accruing that percent, but on the new balance. So the next day, the new balance is 1961.34. The next day is 1962.69, et cetera, et cetera. And so the interest rate for the next day is always going to apply to that next balance, that new balance for the day. So at the start, it's 134 of interest per day, but slowly it goes up 135, 136, et cetera. Yes, there's small amounts, but it does compound over time. So that's the general way the credit cards are structured. And now you know to avoid paying any interest expense, you're gonna to wanna to pay off your card in full each month. The minimum is not enough. So now you get a basic understanding of credit cards and how they function. But the other side of that coin is just simply taking responsible action. And this is really what trips up most people. Most of you intuitively know that you should pay off your card in full. Like, I think we can all agree that's a pretty obvious thing to do. But if you're not paying your card off in full right now, probably means you can't afford to. And if you can't afford to, probably means that you put too much on your card. That's the truth. It really boils down to that. You overextended yourself financially. Maybe it was this past month. Maybe it was six months ago when you let the interest compound. Maybe you had an emergency purchase that you had to make. Maybe it was just gradually over time. 
No matter which one it is, the balance is there now, and it may or may not look a little daunting to you. That's okay, you can bounce back. But more important than any sort of number or metric is really the habits around those numbers and metrics. You need to understand what you can truly afford to put in your card each month. And for many of you, for the time being, the answer may be very little. Again, for the time being. If you can afford to realistically charge 500 a month, but you also have a balance on top of that, well then you're just gonna be treading water. And yes, you may be able to pay off the 500 each month, but what about the rest of your balance? It's not sustainable. And on top of that, here's what's gonna happen slowly. Your balance is gonna increase due to interest. Because remember, each day that balance is calculated based off that new balance, and the new balance is growing each day from the interest. That new balance includes yesterday's interest, the day before's interest, etc., etc. And tomorrow's balance will include today's interest. So it compounds and it compounds. So soon to be treading water, you may only be able to afford like $450 in that card as opposed to 500 because it grew and it grew due to interest. So it eats away at your ability to just live your life, to go to fun events, to eat out, all that stuff. And obviously we want to combat that, especially if you're in college, we want you to live your life. So there's really two modes that you could be in. Number one is repayment mode. Number two is maintenance mode. I want you at maintenance mode and you probably want yourself at maintenance mode, but you got to buckle down for a little bit. Maintenance mode, as you can probably infer, is carrying zero balance. So with that example of being able to charge 500, really charging 500 in that scenario is actually going to be sustainable because you're not going to be paying any interest because there's no other balance. Now, repayment mode, it's exactly what you think it is. If you can afford 500 typically, I want you to charge like 300. And now that's going to take some willpower, but it'll pay off when your balance is paid off. So you could be strategic with this. You could calculate everything you spend in a month and see what fluff you can cut out. Or you could be more intuitive with it day by day, whichever one works for you. Either way, I think it's good to reflect real quick on what some of your common expenses are. And of those, which one are you willing to cut down on or cut fully out? So maybe instead of getting a coffee five days a week, you make it three days a week. Or getting one to two drinks when you go out as opposed to three or four drinks. Maybe you got a sunny angel addiction or maybe you love going out to eat. The point is, there's ways to pare down your expenses temporarily in order to get your debt under control. And by the way, under control means paid off. We don't want you to half-ass this. Trust me, the security is going to be worth it. And when you've paid your balance off fully, this is the point where you've hit maintenance mode. But obviously, like in the name, we want you to maintain that. So treat your card like it's a debit card. You want to charge it only with what you can absolutely afford to pay off. So there's three big points I want to talk about when it comes to approaching debt repayment. We're going to talk about paying yourself first, debt snowball versus debt avalanche, and then what I like to call job slash work strategies. So for paying yourself first, I want you to start looking at paying your credit card off kind of like an investment. If you're in college, it's likely that you have minimal to no experience with investing, but you've probably been at least exposed to the idea of compounding interest, which is simply investing your money so it grows over time at a certain rate. Paying off debt works in a very similar way. Because in most cases, paying off your debt, especially credit card debt, is the best return you can get in your money. Paying off your debt balance is similar in effect to getting a return on a stock. Let's say you pay off $500 in your card, and the rate on that card is 25%. Well, you just got a 25% return on your money, because you're avoiding paying that 25% rate completely. Basically, avoiding a negative compounding, avoiding accruing interest, is the same thing in effect as investing for a positive compounding. So if you have credit card debt, funny enough, you have one of the most lucrative opportunities to get a really good return on your money. So the idea is to pay yourself first. You want to attack this debt balance with a vengeance. And the most important part of that is that it has to become habitual. You got to do it without second thought. So how do we ensure this? The best way is with automatic payments. So credit cards let you set up fixed payments at different intervals, whatever you specify, so that you don't have to put any thought in the process or potentially forget to pay. So let's say you've been paying your minimum balance off for a while, let's say it's $40, but you really want to get serious about paying off your debt and not just treading water. Then you should set a monthly automatic payment of, well, more than $40. Maybe go for $200, $300, for example. Really look at your expenses and see what you can afford to put into that card. The point is to push yourself while also being realistic about what you can pay. So this calls back to the idea of being in repayment mode. And of course, it's good to remind yourself that this is temporary. But for the time being, you need to buckle down. And if you do buckle down, you're going to see that on the other side of this, you're going to have a lot more money freed up to do things that you actually want to do. So setting up automatic payments tells yourself that it's non-negotiable, that this is a number one priority for you. It's so non-negotiable that it's automatic. It's beyond consideration. You just do it. 
So even though that may require a shift in your spending habits to be able to afford to pay off 200, 300 a month, you're doing this because it's an investment in yourself, an investment in your livelihood. The next topic is for people with multiple sources of debt. If you're in college, well, most likely you only have one credit card or one source of debt, but I'm sure there's some of you with multiple. And when you have multiple sources of debt, the next question that arises when you get serious about debt repayment is, what order should I pay off my debt? There's typically two schools of thought, two strategies on how to do this. First is debt snowball. Second one is debt avalanche. Debt snowball, this is your Dave Ramsey strategy. This leverages human psychology over just pure raw numbers. And debt avalanche is your mathematically more superior strategy. From the start, I'm gonna tell you, debt avalanche is always gonna save you more money in the long run than debt snowball but that's only if we disregard human psychology because we're not perfect. I mean, there's so many non-numeric factors that go into debt repayment. There's motivation, there's emotional state, there's spending habits. So we can look at both strategies a little more holistically. So debt snowball is where you pay off the lowest balance first and debt avalanche is where you pay off the highest interest rate first. Debt snowball is all about psychological momentum, hence the snowball. So you're gonna feel a big spike in motivation when you pay off that first debt, that easiest debt with the lowest balance you're gonna hit those checkpoints faster and feel like you're progressing more, which will increase your motivation. With debt avalanche, since you're attacking the highest interest rate first, that's what is gonna technically save you the most money in the long run. This strategy is great for people who are more diligent, more consistent, and more self-motivated. But if you're more likely to get discouraged, you may benefit more from debt snowball. So let's illustrate an example real quick. So in this example, you have three debts. And so I purposely structured it to show how the strategies can differ in terms of order of paying. The debts are $500, $1,500, and $5,000 for the three balances. And respectively, their rates are 5%, 12.5%, and 29%. Debt Snowball is going to say, okay, let's attack the lowest balance first, which is going to be the $500 one. And once you pay off the first one pretty easily, you're going to be able to leverage that psychological momentum to pay off the next one, the next one, etc. Debt Avalanche is going to say, well, that 29% interest rate is pretty high, so we're going to pay that one off first to maximize interest saved. Because remember, paying off debt is essentially the same thing in effect as getting a return on an investment. So Debt Avalanche says, well, this investment of 29%, that's the best return on my money I can get here, so I'm gonna go for it first. And it's true, you're always gonna save the most interest expense or avoid the most interest expense if you target the highest interest rate first. And then from there, the next highest, the next highest, etc. The only issue is psychologically, it's not always gonna feel like you're making the most progress because the highest interest rate is not necessarily gonna be the lowest balance. So it may take a while before you get that first hit of dopamine or checkpoint in your progression of debt repayment. In this scenario, since the highest rate is also the highest balance, it's gonna take a while before you actually feel like you're making any progress or hit that checkpoint. That's why debt snowball is used so widely for people who need that motivation in order to keep themselves on track. So those are the two strategies, debt snowball, debt avalanche. Again, this really only applies when you have multiple sources of debt. So if you have student loans, for example, as well, you could bring those into the mix. You can factor those in as well. And if you have one source of debt, then you really only have one choice on what to attack first. The final point on this umbrella topic of how to pay off your debt is job and work strategies. As a college kid, you likely have been working part-time jobs, serving jobs, tap desks, like work study jobs, barista jobs. It's a big variety in what you can do. But I want to make sure you're working these part-time jobs in a way that's going to best support your ability to pay off your own debt. So my first strategy is to pick the right job. This is sort of an umbrella for a couple points. You want to first avoid money draining jobs and you also want to max out your hourly wage. Most jobs aren't inherently money draining, but some circumstances make it easy, make it convenient for you to spend money while on the clock or while on the job. For example, if your job is a far commute away, it's going to put you in situations where you're more likely to want to Uber to work. And obviously expenses like this add up. All it could take is a rainy day, a low motivation day, maybe you feel tired and you're probably gonna be Ubering back and forth. Other jobs may encourage you or may make it easy for you to spend while on the clock. Typically these can be like food service jobs, clothing stores with generous discounts, or businesses that are located near convenient restaurants. Now I'm not saying don't work at a restaurant or don't work at a clothing store. Instead, just be mindful of the habits that you may be getting yourself into just because the job makes it convenient. Packing a lunch instead of getting food from the food court is going to save you a lot of money in the long run. And now to max out your wage, you want to look at the variety of jobs that are available around you and then what conditions you want to work in. Some of you may not want to deal with the high stress environment of being a server. And that's okay. Everyone is different. Just start to get a feel for what jobs around you pay best and how willing you are to work those jobs. 
Another tip could be to transfer to a higher paying location. This is more for like tip based jobs. So for me, I worked at a lobster roll place in college. I started off in one location and with tips I was making between like 15 or 18 an hour. But a few train stops away was the same lobster chain and that location happened to be the busiest one in the entire country. And you know, it's Boston, there's tourists, they want lobsters. So in the summer, especially the pay was between like 18 to 26 on the high end, depending on how busy it was. So again, weigh the pros and the cons. If you're down to work at a busier location, I'd say go for it. Next strategy is to slowly increment your hours. At that same lobster roll place, there used to be between six or seven of us behind the counter at peak hours. And we'd be scheduled in this sort of staggered way so two to three people would start, the peak hours it would get up to six or seven people, and then as we get towards closing, it becomes two or three people again. So when I felt up to it, I used to switch with people to get like one or two more hours. And I found I was able to handle it because it was only a slight increase in hours. So as opposed to picking up an entire shift, this is a way to slowly increment your hours when you feel up to it. And the final strategy is to work in higher paying timeframes. So again, typically for tip-based jobs, I've heard of servers who primarily try to work closing shifts because of the same idea. The staff gets cut as the night progresses. So if you're one of the few who are left at the end of the night, you're gonna be picking up a greater percentage of the tables and thus taking home a greater percentage of the tips. But the same idea could apply to working a Sunday brunch shift, to working holidays, or just working weekends as opposed to weekdays. We talked about a lot of topics in this video. So let's do a little bit of an overview before we move on to the last section. First was introducing this idea of credit card debt and understanding how prevalent it actually is in college kids. Next was a crash course on credit cards, on financial literacy. So understanding credit limits, interest rates, and how interest actually accrues. After that was financial responsibility. So understanding being in maintenance mode versus repayment mode. And what we just talked about was strategies for paying off debt, paying yourself first. So this is making debt repayment a number one priority for you, treating it like an investment because it is. Debt snowball versus debt avalanche. So understanding how to manage multiple sources of debt and which one to attack first. So this could be multiple credit cards. This could be a mix of credit cards and student loans even. And job and work strategies. So strategically picking your job so that you aren't tempted to drain money on the clock. Think Ubers, think food, etc. And also strategically picking your hours so you can maximize how much you earn. And so now that you have a basic understanding of credit cards and how to pay off your debt, the final section of the video is how to wield your card responsibly. If you're like me, you were warned as an adolescent against even getting a credit card or using your credit card for anything. Even opening a credit card was framed as a terrible idea. And it's good hearted advice. You can get into massive amounts of debt that could potentially saddle you for years, but that's not what needs to happen. The credit card is not the issue. It's the habits around how you use your credit card that can either contribute to your well being or lack thereof. So like any good tool, you gotta learn how to wield it properly. A good first question to ask yourself is this. Say you have an option to pick between two credit cards. First one carries a 15% interest rate. Second one carries a 15,000% interest rate. Which one do you want to pick? I'm sure you're probably thinking the 15% one. But really, it's a trick question. Obviously, it's a really extreme example. It's not realistic. But the big lesson here is if you use your card properly, the interest rate does not matter at all. If you're using your card properly, that means you're not putting more in the card than you can afford to pay off each month. And what does that mean? Well, since you're paying your card off each month, you will never pay interest, zero. And when you do this, the interest rate of any card has zero effect on you. Now, to be fair, there are some advanced strategies that do leverage credit in order to pay off your balances faster, velocity banking for one. And in that case, an interest rate would come into play, but for like 95% of people, and definitely like 99% of college students, you won't be needing to use that strategy. And therefore, you won't need to worry about or even look at the interest rate of the cards that you have when you're opening them. The rate isn't relevant to you because you're smart with your money. You're gonna pay off your balance in full each month. And as a result, you're gonna pay zero in interest. But let's also talk about the logistics of that. If you look at your mobile banking, you may see multiple metrics, multiple numbers. Total balance is simply how much you have left to pay off in the card in full. But there's no assumption of a due date baked into that. It's simply how much is outstanding in total. So the way credit cards manage when certain charges are due is through a statement balance because every purchase you make is going to fall within a specific period, a specific statement balance window. The window is typically a month. So let's say your windows May 1st to May 31st You can make as many purchases as you want in that May window. And yes, your total balance will go up, but your statement balance for the time being will stay at zero until June 1st when your statement balance updates to include all the charges from that past period of May 1st to May 31st. 
and only then will your due date first appear. It's not even due yet. From then on, you typically have close to a month to pay off that whole statement balance. So in my statements, I typically have 25 days from when the statement balance came out to actually pay. So in our example, if you make a purchase on May 2nd, you really don't have to pay it until June 25th because that's when the entire statement for that May window is actually due on June 25th. So this is important for planning when you wanna pay things, it gives you a little wiggle room. And for me especially, I used to log in like every week or so out of paranoia and just pay off whatever I saw because I was worried that some charge I would make would fall incorrectly and I would miss it and I would get an interest charge or a late fee or something like that. But when you understand statement balance versus total balance, you can see that what I was doing was stupid. You have such a larger window to pay before something is actually due. And it's only after that due date that anything that isn't paid will be hit with that interest charge. So now both you and I know that when you charge something to your card, what's due and when it's due is actually determined based on the statement balance, not the total balance. So for example, you could pay off everything before the statement balance even hits. And that payment is gonna be reflected in the statement. When it does come out, it's just gonna be zero. But it's good to know that you have this larger buffer before you technically have to pay. And again, I'm still advocating that you pay off in full. Like do not spend more than what you can afford. Like I've been saying, treat it like it's a debit card. But simply understanding that the statement balance is what's actually due can really help you understand what is due and when. And my final point is to use your credit card on everything that you can afford. Now, there's some assumptions that are baked into this statement. And because you may think, oh, isn't it a little risky to put everything on a credit card? So the strategy really only applies if you're in maintenance mode, if you've paid off your card and balance fully. Because when you pay off all your debt, that's when you can really start to milk all the amazing benefits the credit cards can actually give you. A big perk of even using a credit card is that you can gain rewards in the form of cash back or in the form of points. And if you have credit card debt, even the idea of just using a credit card in a positive way may seem like so out of reach. But once you get there, it's great to know that you can actually use credit cards in a way that's going to save you money. If you put the right purchases on the right card, you can often get 3, 4, 5% back depending on what you put on that card and depending on the category. Some people, including myself, have a rough strategy where we put groceries on one card, restaurants on another card to maximize our points back or our cash back. And by doing this, you can ensure that you're really never paying full price on anything. You're always gonna get at least 1% back. The one big caveat is rent. There's almost no scenarios where you're gonna be able to put rent on your credit card. But for most purchases, again, if you can afford it, it makes sense to put it on the credit card because you can get that cash back, you can get those points. So there you have it. That was my crash course on managing credit card debt in college. If you enjoyed it, if you're looking for more financial content, hit subscribe. I'm Ian The Sage. I'm a 20-something who makes personal finance content for other 20-somethings. And I thank you for watching. I'll catch you all next time.